Critter Calamity, a Wisteria Witch's Mysteries Christmas Short Story, Book 12.5, written by Angela Pepper, narrated by Tiffany Williams. This is a Christmas-themed short story that fits between Wisteria Witch's Mysteries Book 12, Winter in Wisteria, and Book 13, Wisteria Wedding. It can be read as a standalone story. Chapter 1 December 23rd, Two Days to Christmas My undead mother and I were walking down the sidewalk when she suddenly grabbed my hand and gave me a panicked look. Now what? I groaned. Is this about my ugly Christmas sweater? I'm not going home to change it, so if you can't bear being seen with me in public, just say the word and I'll cast a camouflage spell so nobody knows it's you. Of course, the only spell I'm good at will disguise you as a leafy bush, which will be awkward when you try to order a coffee, but shouldn't stop you entirely. People around here in Wisteria are used to weird things. The skinny, black-haired, pale and gorgeous woman clutched my fingers tighter. Her eyes widened even more as she took in short, sharp inhales. I checked over my shoulder to make sure we weren't being crept up on by a giant genetically engineered bird, a pain-eating demon from another dimension, or a flesh-eating plant. You know, the usual suspects. The coast was clear, as was the winter sky making for a bright, crisp day. The exact sort of day my mother loved to ruin. Just as I was about to say something else that would likely lead to an argument, my undead mother closed her pale, blue-tinged eyelids and let out the biggest sneeze I'd ever heard. Bless you, I said. She shuddered, then sneezed two more times, even louder. Bless you, bless you, I said, unless it's wrong to bless the cursed. She shot me a dirty look and sneezed a fourth time. I pried my fingers out of her clenched hand. Are you going to be okay? Should I call your necromancer? Necromancer was what I called the elf doctor who'd brought my mother back from the dead as a vampire. It was our little joke. My mother hated it. Okay, it was my little joke. Zarabella, you know how much I hate to complain, my mother said with zero trace of irony. But I do have very sensitive sinuses, and your Christmas decor leaves a lot to be desired. She brought her jacket sleeve up to her nose and sniffed it. The scent is clinging to me. I thought getting outdoors would help, but it seems I've brought the repugnant odor of your dwelling with me. My house is a bit dusty, I admitted, and populated with too many freeloading animals who shed fur, feathers, and scales, but my decorations don't. Oh, you mean the little mini trees on the big tree? I waved a hand. You're being overly dramatic, as usual. Zoe and I have been collecting those air fresheners from gas stations since she was a toddler. Most of them are sun-faded and hardly smell at all. Artificial scents are terrible for human health, said the black-haired vampire. They're full of neurotoxins and endocrine disruptors. She blinked at me. As is your refrigerator. Have you considered purchasing groceries that don't come in a box with a photograph of what the contents might look like in a parallel universe if it were actual food? I threw my hands in the air. You got me. I'm not as health conscious as you, with your free-range organic blood bag boyfriend. Speaking of which, is Nick going to join us for Christmas dinner? She pursed her lips in disapproval. And subject him to your cooking? Hasn't he suffered enough this year? I gave her a tight smile. Considering who he's dating, I suppose you're right. Poor Nick. The dramatic sneezes had stopped, so we resumed our walk. The sidewalks in the heart of Wisteria were bustling with people doing their last-minute Christmas shopping. Those who weren't bustling stopped to chat under giant winter garlands and bells, the town was postcard adorable all year round, with its quaint shops and busy cafes on the main streets, but it was downright magical in late December. Most of the residents weren't aware of magic, or that supernatural beings were in their midst. The bakery in town was run by a Gorgon baker. But most people understood there was something special beneath the surface. Lately, real estate prices had been rising. 
it seemed that our little secret was getting out. My daughter and I had moved there in the spring of that year, so we were as guilty as anyone of making the quaint town slightly more urban. Not that people held it against us. Most had been welcoming, besides the ones who'd tried to kill me, but that's the sort of thing you have to live with when you're a witch. Nick is rather young, my mother said in a conversational tone. I snorted. You think? Zara Bella, she said with a pained sigh. Have you ever considered responding to a person with something other than your sass? I suppose I might if I did any consideration at all before I spoke. Exactly, I reluctantly said, point taken. We turned the corner and headed toward our destination, Dreamland Coffee. The owner, a member of my coven, was throwing her annual eggnog festival. I'd been told by everyone that it was unmissable. During the day, the eggnog was served hot with caffeine, and after the sunset, which would be in about two hours, it was served cold with rum and other things that fell into a gray zone between legal and illegal. I am speaking, of course, about certain species of mushrooms. You were saying? I said, about Nick being too young for you? I said he was rather young. That's code for too young. I suppose it is. How did you get to be so smart? Is it the fox genes? She was referring to my father, the fox shifter. I regarded her with suspicion. Why are you being so nice to me? Don't tell me you're dying. Again. I'm not dying any time soon, she said matter-of-factly, but I have been thinking about my future and my retirement plans. Retirement plans? That's something people with jobs do. What's your plan? Get a job for a few months, then retire? She blinked at me in disbelief. I work. You're a lot of work, I said. I work, she said again. I'm a consultant. Of course you are. People pay top dollar for me to tell them what I think. I took it all in. She had mentioned consulting work a few times. I had always assumed she was using it as a euphemism for freeloading off wealthy supernaturals, like the pack of deceased rock stars and industry titans she ran with in Venice. It's very fulfilling work, she said. Getting paid to tell people what you think? I said. I suppose don't? She shot me a warning look, along with a blast of her vampire magic. She wasn't able to choke me into silence, but her powerful stares did make my neck feel tight in a way that got my attention. Whatever snark you were about to say, don't. How do you know it was going to be snark? Your face. The snark lights up your eyes on the way out of your mouth. I squeezed my eyes shut and let it out in a torrent before she could stop me. I suppose being bossy is more of a hobby than a career since you do it for free. When I opened my eyes, she was giving me a hurt look. Not just her usual mildly offended look, but one of genuine hurt. There was a sheen in her eyes that I told myself must have been from the crisp air. She looked away, cleared her throat, and picked up her pace. Lighten up, I said, jogging to catch up. If you squeeze my throat like that, what do you think I'm going to do? I didn't squeeze your throat, she said. Of course you did. You've been doing it for the last week. Whenever we talk about anything serious, you give me that look and you use your Darth Vader powers to try to squelch me. She stopped in her tracks, staring straight ahead. Something's wrong, she said. Her tone told me it had nothing to do with our conversation. I followed her gaze. There was a crowd of people gathered in front of Dreamling Coffee. It was a big crowd, but no bigger than the crowds I'd seen gathered there when the local jogging club gathered for their post-run treats. Are you sure about that? I asked. Just because there's a crowd doesn't mean something's wrong. The people in this town love showing up for their annual events, especially if they can get psychoactive drugs, by which I mean caffeine, which is technically psychoactive. 
she shushed me. I was offended, as only a librarian could be when shushed by a non-librarian, but I kept my snort quiet. As we drew closer to the crowd, my witch senses tingled with a vague warning. I cast a spell, and it caught something. You may be right, I whispered to my mother. I did a threat detection spell, and the windows of the coffee shop are sparkling brighter than that time I tried to microwave a foil-lined pan of lasagna. The crowd in front of us was growing and murmuring in concern. People talked through their confusion. The sign says they're open, a woman said. Why is the door shut? And what's all over the windows I can't see in? The door doesn't feel like it's locked, but I can't get it open, a man said. It feels like someone inside is holding it shut. A woman said, do you think they need help in there? It could be a robbery, a man said. The word robbery rippled through the crowd. Another person said, what is that stuff all over the windows? It's like paint or soap. I can't see through it. Look, it's seeping out under the door. It's a liquid, a thick liquid. Is that eggnog? Someone's child stooped down, poked a finger in the river of pale goo seeping under the door, and licked it. Tastes like eggnog, the child reported to the crowd. Most of the adults murmured to each other in confusion, while a few of them also stooped down to taste the river of eggnog as it flowed across the sidewalk. Not bad, said one woman, smacking her lips. Needs more nutmeg said another woman. A tall, muscular man grabbed the door handle and reefed on it while grunting out, Almost! 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 I looked over at my mother, who was simply watching the scene with amusement. We should probably do something, I said to her. Go ahead, she said, gesturing for me to venture forth. Don't let me stop you from drinking eggnog from the sidewalk with the rest of your friends. I mean, we should probably do something about whatever's going on in there. This is the coffee house owned by one of your witch friends? This is the one where you hold your coven meetings and regularly practice spells? We mostly argue, but yes, a witch owns this place. Then whatever is going on inside must be her business. Fine, we can just go back home. I'm sure I could make something resembling eggnog. Not so fast. She couldn't take her eyes off the scene. I'd like to see where this is going. Famous last words, I said. I'd like to see where this is going. The muscular man was still reefing on the door, and he'd recruited two other strapping men to help. They were rocking it back and forth to unstick it, the way a group might push a car out of a snowbank. The men were saying, Almost! 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 My mother said, I believe that's a sticking spell someone has used on the door. What would you say, as a witch? As a witch, I'd say that does have all the hallmarks of a sticking spell. How long does it take for the spell to wear off? Depends on the force being applied. Given the torque those guys are applying, I'd say it's got less than a minute of holding left. Zarabella, I don't think the windows are simply coated from the inside with eggnog. Me neither. The cafe appeared to be filled with eggnog, like a fishbowl except filled with eggnog instead of water. Something came through the white liquid toward us. A pair of Dreamland coffee mugs floated against the windows and clinked together on the glass. My mother said, When that door finally opens... She gave me a knowing look, glanced around, then took my elbow and moved both of us over by about five feet. We waited. As bad as it was to be curious, I did want to see where this was going. She said, You could do something to cancel the door-sticking spell. And ruin all the suspense? Perhaps there's danger afoot. You said your threat detection spell picked up something. It did. There is a glow for sure, but the color isn't one of the deadly hues. This clearly falls in the range between mischief and shenanigans. Aren't those the same thing? 
Actually, I was cut off by a giant river of eggnog rushing past me. The three men who had been working together to open the door had succeeded and were now being washed into the street on a tide of the aromatic beverage. My mother clapped her hands together and squealed with glee. This is... Chapter 2 While my mother and I were able to avoid the tidal wave of eggnog flowing from Dreamland Coffee, the other Wisteria residents were not so lucky. Everyone who had been waiting to get eggnog got what they'd come for, albeit not in the manner they would have wanted. The drenched crowd howled in outrage, incredulity, and also appreciation. A man said, I didn't come here to take a fire hose of nog up the nose. A woman said, How do you suppose they got that much eggnog inside the coffee shop in the first place? Another woman said, Helen, I was wrong. It has exactly the right amount of nutmeg. She smacked her lips. Not bad. And then, being the fearless residents of Wisteria that even the non-magical folks were, the crowd simply stepped over the ebbing sea of eggnog and entered the coffee shop, holding each other's elbows and giggling as they slipped on the remaining nog. I could hear the cafe owner, Maisie Nix, yelling over the din, just give us a minute to get some dry beans from the stockroom, folks, and we'll be up and running in no time. Sorry for the, uh, technical glitch. These things happen. There's nothing unusual going on here. By the sound of the responses, people were buying it. I detected some nimble spell work woven in under her words. I had to hand it to Maisie. She wasn't the easiest witch to get along with, but her witch tongue was impeccable. So was her cleaning magic. The floor inside the cafe was practically mopping itself. Maisie's niece and fellow witch Fatima Nix was going from person to person, casting spells to clean them up. As dramatic as it had been, the situation was well under control. The locals would be walking out with dry clothes, eggnog lattes, and zero recollection of what had happened. I wonder if this happens every year, I said. I'd like a dark roast if they have it, my mother said. I turned to her and raised an eyebrow. Too scared to come inside? Absolutely not. My mother wrinkled her nose. There's far too much magic flying around fast and loose in there. If I step inside, I'm liable to reverse the polarity and jinx everything. Hmm. I rubbed my thin thoughtfully. Do you suppose that your being here had anything to do with what just happened? Or did you do something? No! She looked horrified. Why would I fill a coffee shop with a sea of eggnog? I don't know. Why does one of my house pets let the budgie out of the cage to terrorize my daughter? Some creatures just love to watch the world burn. She stared at me for a long time. I see, she said curtly. Now I'm a creature who wants to watch the world burn. I'm also a zombie, a monster, and a creature of the grave. That's why you dressed up as me for your little Halloween party. I'm nothing to you except something to be mocked. It was just a joke, I said. Jokes are supposed to be funny. You, Zarabella, are not funny. Ouch! I started walking into the coffee shop. Clearly, you're in a weird mood about something. I'll give you a few minutes to reload while I get us some coffee. Despite my casual tone, I was still fuming by the time I got up to the counter. The owner, Maisie Nix, shooed her employee aside so she could take my order personally. Maisie was tall and imposing, with black hair and elegant features. If there were a fashion magazine for witches, she'd be the cover model. I said to her, What was that all about? She gave me a blank look. To what are you referring? You know what I'm talking about. I was standing outside when it happened. It was like a scene from The Shining. Her eyes sparkled. I love that movie. So was it intentional? The, um, parting of the eggnog sea? She shrugged. I don't know what happened. Something must have gotten into the vat of cream. She looked around. I haven't seen Humphrey. Is he with you? You lost your Komodo dragon? She rolled her eyes. 
I'm sure he's not lost. Humphrey always knows exactly where he is. But he's a Komodo dra- Never mind. I'll take two dark roast lattes with eggnog, assuming you have some nog that hasn't been all over the sidewalk. Of course. She started making the lattes. Is Bentley back already? Not yet. The second one is for my mother. She's waiting outside. Oh, right. Zarconia riddle. You should invite her to the next book club meeting. Book club was code for our small coven. She is still one of us, even if she's not practicing. You should bring her along. She'd love that. She'd love to tell us all what we're doing wrong. Maisie laughed hollowly. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I gave her a sarcastic laugh back. Maisie and I had tried a few different approaches to our relationship and concluded we were most comfortable as frenemies, but the good kind of frenemies, where we took jabs at each other when life was relaxed, but would fight to the death for each other in times of crisis. Like family. Maisie handed over my two steaming takeout cups. I tried to pay, but she wouldn't let me. See you at the tree lighting later tonight, she said. Maybe Bentley will show up by then so you don't have to be so sad and dateless. And maybe some new guy who hasn't been warned about you will wander into your trap and we can double date. She smiled. That would be fun. I thanked her for the coffee and went outside to meet my mother. She was nowhere to be seen. Had she learned how to play invisible? I cast several reveal spells, then checked the area for her bird familiars. I also listened for screams of terror. Nothing. Then I did what any witch would do in such a situation. I pulled out my phone and called her. She answered in a very tired voice. If it's all the same to you, I'm going to do some last-minute shopping on my own, Zarabella. What about your latte? What about the museum and the tree lighting? I'm sure you'll think of something. She ended the call. I stared at my phone. Had the magical mischief and the river of eggnog scared her away, or was she actually mad at me? I sipped eggnog number one. It was delicious. My mother must have been freaked out by the magic. She'd renounced her witch powers at a young age and claimed she was fine with other people practicing, but I always had the impression it disgusted her. Yes, she'd been freaked out by the magic. Who could get mad at me? I was delightful. Zara tries to be a good witch. Chapter 3 Two hours later, dinner was served at Casa Riddle. It was not the dinner anyone had been hoping for. My 16-year-old daughter Zoe looked at the picture of the lasagna on the box, then at the steaming casserole dish on the table, then at the picture on the box again. Don't, I said. Don't what? She gave me an innocent, genuinely innocent, not fake innocent, look. Zoe was a good kid and frequently more mature than me. Never mind, I said. Your mother's just being grumpy about her day. You can go ahead and complain about dinner if you'd like. Let it rip. I'm not the chef, so I promise I won't be offended. She poked the slab on her plate. Sometimes when it looks bad, it tastes good, my daughter said in her usual cheerful way. Plus, there's cheese on top. It's hard to go wrong when there's cheese on top. She took a bite, made a face, and swallowed hard. That bad? It's not the worst thing you've made. There was the pizza with curried eggplant and the tofu lentil meatloaf. I almost lost friends over that one. I took a bite and chewed a moment. The lasagna in reality was a far cry from the image on the cover, but it did contain the holy trio of flavors, tomato sauce, cheese, and noodle. In spite of this, it still wasn't good. I despise this lasagna, I said as I shoveled it into my mouth. On the plus side, nobody's in here begging for scraps, trying to poop on us from the chandelier, or threatening to eviscerate us if we don't let him lick the pan with his long purple tongue. She was referring to Boa, our cat, Marza Pants, the budgie who had been left to us in a will by a former neighbor, and Ribbons, our resident pint-sized wyvern. 
It is nice to have a meal in peace, I said. Now that you mention it, this lasagna is tasting better by the minute. Where's Gigi? Gigi was what my daughter called her grandmother. Did she have a date with Nick tonight? No idea, I said. I was inside Dreamland getting her an eggnog latte, and when I came outside, she was gone. I know she can be dramatic, but this was beyond rude. I might have actually been scared for her if I didn't know your grandmother is already the most terrifying thing currently residing in this town. What were you two fighting about? I don't know. I might have said something about Nick being on the young side. Zoe gave me a blank look. But she's so proud of herself for dating a younger guy. It must have been something else. Did you say something about her weight? She's very sensitive about it. I think she's gained a little since she started staying with us. She came to my room this morning to borrow a pair of pants. That must be it, I said. She gained three ounces, and it's all my fault. I ruined her figure by growing inside her all those years ago, and I'm at it again. But not from the inside, obviously. I think you two should find a better way to communicate, maybe with a therapist in the room. You're suggesting I go to therapy with her? I stared at my teen daughter. I know we're not a normal family, but shouldn't you at least pretend to be a normal teen sometimes? Why aren't you glued to your phone getting low self-esteem from social media? Zoe shrugged. Sometimes I forget where my phone even is. You are not normal. Neither are you. She took another bite and grimaced. You don't have to eat that, I said, using magic to levitate the food up and away into the kitchen. But sometimes I forget that we aren't as poor as we were back when you were little. We're rich now. Well, rich enough that we don't have to scrape the mold off the cheese. We could buy new clothes that haven't been worn by anyone if we wanted to. True, and we would buy new clothes if it was as much fun. I think we have it pretty good. I nodded vehemently. Yesterday, when I bought grapes, I didn't even look at the price. I stood. We can go out for dinner on a weeknight for no reason at all. She got to her feet as well. I could eat. She patted her pockets. Where's my phone? I'm supposed to meet Ambrosia later for the tree lighting thing. I summoned her phone, sailed it into her hand, and said, Tell her to come meet up with us for dinner. My treat. We can all go to the tree lighting together, assuming you're not too embarrassed to be seen with me in my ugly Christmas sweater. Oh, Zoe said, tilting her head back. So you're aware that the sweater is ugly. That actually explains a lot. We headed to the kitchen from the dining room. I plopped the leftover lasagna into the plastic container and put it in the fridge. Zoe gave me a wary look. Is this a trick? Are you going to serve that again tomorrow night? It's a trick, but not that kind. I have to pretend it's good or the wyvern disposal unit won't take the bait. Mom, he eats cat food. Only because we don't want him to. I grabbed my pink purse, all the better to clash with my ugly Christmas sweater, and we were off. Chapter 4 After a delicious dinner with my daughter and her best friend at Vijay's Indian Food Buffet, the three of us walked around outside. Ambrosia Abernathy was a witch like me. Also like me, her specialty involved seeing and communicating with ghosts. Lately, I'd taken to subcontracting some of my witch business to her. Mostly the grunt work, like reviewing the life memories of the ghosts who couldn't stay away from either of us. We were like catnip for the restless undead. The young girl didn't seem to mind doing my dirty work. Ambrosia came from a non-magical family, so she was happy to get the training where she could. Ambrosia had even said I was a good teacher. Zara tries to be a good witch mentor. Plus, I very rarely got her into life-threatening danger. She'd only nearly died a couple of times during the year. As we walked, Ambrosia rubbed her stomach and said, I'm so full from that buffet, I may never eat again. Same here, I agreed, except for the part about never eating again. 
I don't think I've ever been that full. Come to think of it, does anyone want an ice cream sundae? Ambrosia groaned. A burst! Maybe later, Zoe said. We could get an eggnog sundae at Dreamland after the tree lighting. Ambrosia, I'm sure you'll have room by then. Ambrosia let out an unladylike burp that made me proud, then asked, How can VGs afford to let people eat so much food for a flat rate? I saw that huge guy, Knox, and his buddy Rob filling up on what must have been their fifth plates. Those two alone are going to put them out of business. She was voicing the same concern I'd had when the owners had opened the restaurant earlier that year in a former garage. At least they haven't gone under yet, I said. I don't know how they pay the bills. It's a type of magic, Zoe said matter-of-factly, as though she knew it for a fact. We had been walking three abreast and formed a single file to make room for some other people who were out enjoying the twinkling lights and Christmas decorations. Once they'd passed out of earshot, I asked Zoe to explain what she meant. It's magic, she said, just as matter-of-factly. Magic doesn't do much good with food, I said. Otherwise, I'd be a master chef. No kidding, Ambrosia said. Every witch knows that you never use magic to enhance your food or your face or body. A little bit on your hair sometimes, but maybe not. That's why Margaret Mills has such crazy hair. Too much spell work. Margaret was my aunt's best friend and another member of the coven. Zoe made a know-it-all, huh? She thinks she's on to the secret of VJ's endless buffet, I said to Ambrosia. I bet she smelled something with her fox nose. Not even, Zoe said. In unison, Ambrosia and I said, well? It's actually quite clever, Zoe said. I can't believe you two haven't figured it out. I'm not even a witch, but it was obvious to me. Ambrosia and I exchanged a look. Zoe was a fox shifter with a keen sense of smell. More importantly, she was extremely smart. Whenever she read a textbook, even at a skimming pace, the information stayed in her head the first try. She didn't brag about her smarts much, but she must have been feeling big in the head that evening. Ambrosia let out an impatient sigh. Do we both have to witch pool up and tandem spell it out of you, or are you going to tell us? She gave me a conspiratorial look and said, Zara, if we can round up a third, we can do a Trinata's confession hex. Zoe lifted her freckled nose in the air and said lightly, No need to get nasty. Next time you're at the buffet, have a look at the rice. A good look. Ambrosia squeaked. Are you saying the rice is not rice? It's something else, something living, like maggots? I gagged a little and shot the young witch a disapproving look. Ambrosia shrugged. I watched Lost Boys recently. It's pretty good for an old movie. There's a scene where the rice in the takeout food is maggots, except I think it's a hallucination. It's nothing like that, Zoe said. The individual grains of rice in the buffet aren't the normal shape. They're prolate spheroids. Ambrosia said, in English? She means tiny footballs, I said. Prolate spheroids are the approximate shape of celestial bodies and inflated pig bladders, which is what footballs were originally made from. Ew, Ambrosia said. And you thought I was gross for talking about maggots? The rice in the buffet is shaped like tiny footballs, my daughter said. Haven't you ever noticed? Rice does come in different varieties, Ambrosia said. I thought it was a short grain variety. Even short grain isn't quite like this, Zoe said. Either it's the rice itself or spell work done as it's cooking. I took some home and had a good look at it under a microscope. You're such a nerd, Ambrosia said. I said, we have a microscope? It's in the attic, Zoe said. We have an attic? It was hard to stay on top of how our magical house was configured, given how it was always changing. When I need to use a microscope, we have an attic, Zoe said. Your house is so weird, Ambrosia said. Back to the rice, I said. Zoe said, The starch has been restructured. It's still starch, but it's more resistant to being broken down. 
Not only are the grains of rice three times larger in size than they ought to be, which affects the stretch receptors in people's stomachs, but the resistant starches also convert to glucose more slowly. People who sell sports bars have been claiming to have created resistant starches for ages, but they haven't been nearly as successful as whoever makes that rice. Don't you see? That's why you can eat at VJ's and you're not hungry again an hour later. Ambrosia asked the question I'd been wondering. Should we stay away from that rice? I don't know if I want to be abusing my uh, stretch receptors like that. It's not just the rice. The rest of the food has been altered in other ways, Zoe said. I thought you guys knew. All the restaurants in Wisteria do it. The amino acids are split and rebonded for better ratios between glycine and methionine. That's why most of the people who live here are, you know, skinnier than average. Our local food has all been processed, but in a good way. It's only logical. I think it's what the whole global processed food industry would do if they were, you know, not evil, Ambrosia said. You've put a lot of thought into this, I said to my daughter. Are you thinking about a career in food engineering? She snorted. You mean like Aunt Zinnia and that mayonnaise she sold to the military? My daughter was referring to zero nays, which was officially classified as a bioweapon. Ambrosia gave us a stunned. What? Long story, I said to the junior witch. If you're at Zinnia's house, don't eat anything from her fridge without checking with her first. And if you see something in a jar that looks like eyeballs, it's eyeballs. Good to know, Ambrosia said. We reached the end of the block and waited to cross the street over to the park where the tree lighting ceremony would be taking place. There was a crowd gathering. I recognized them as some of the same people who had been at Dreamland Coffee a few hours earlier, including the trio who'd yanked the door open. The three men were laughing and clapping each other on the backs, clearly having bonded over the strange event, despite not being able to remember what exactly it was. I looked around at the smiling residents and wondered if that was part of the secret to what made the town so pleasant. Had everyone been through a harrowing experience? or several, that they couldn't remember, but that had bonded them to various friends and neighbors? It was a pleasant thought, and it warmed me despite the chill in the air. The warm feeling didn't last long. Maisie Nix spotted us through the crowd and came our way, dragging a tall, handsome stranger in her wake. He was dressed up to the max, in a red velvet tuxedo paired with a green bow tie. His outfit fell somewhere between high fashion and a Halloween costume you might put on your helpless pet for your own twisted amusement. Maisie looked down her nose and said, Poor Zara Riedel, dateless as usual. Her dressed-up date grinned at me in a strange, blank manner, as though he knew me, yet didn't know who he was or why he was there. I see you rustled up a date for yourself, I said through a tight smile. Something like that. I held out my hand to the gentleman. Have we met? He stared at my hand like it had come out of nowhere and then slowly grasped it and squeezed tentatively. In a deep voice, he said, Nice to meet you. I repeated myself. Have we met? He looked at Maisie. She shook her head. No. He said, No. Strange, I said. You seem very familiar. You wish, Maisie said with a sniff. She explained to the man, Zara works at the library. She's a busybody and she loves knowing everyone in town's deepest desires. I do not, I said, offended. But you know what people read, she said. Oh, she did have a point there. When you knew which books people chose to read in their free time, it did tell you a lot about their deepest desires. Lately, the ladies of Wisteria have been exhibiting deep desires for blue men from alien planets, whatever that meant. Lovely to see both, too, Maisie said, looking at Zoe and Ambrosia. Come by the cafe later for eggnog Sundays. We're open until midnight. You can try the lion's mane mushroom blend, or the other one, the special blend. She winked repeatedly. That is, if it's okay with Zara. The teen girls both gave me hopeful looks. No way, I said. 
you two get in more than enough trouble without magic mushrooms. I know psychedelics are trendy right now, but you're both too young. Sput a sput, Maisie said with a pout. Then she flung her black hair over her shoulder and whisked her date away before I could interrogate the strange man further. Ambrosia leaned in and said, Did that man in the red velvet tuxedo seem a bit off to you? I said, A bit? You think? Zoe snorted. Ambrosia raised her hand, pointed in the direction Maisie had gone, and started making gestures. We need to find out what she's got brewing under. I grabbed the young witch's hand and stopped her. You know better, I said. We don't fireball first and ask questions later. But I wasn't going to fireball. It's an expression, I said. Whatever weird stuff Maisie is up to, it's her business, not ours. Zoe cut in. But what about the big eggnog flood at Maisie's coffee shop today? Zoe knew about the flood because I'd told her. Lately, I've been telling her everything, excluding the details about my love life with my vampire detective boyfriend. Ambrosia hadn't heard about the eggnog, so I quickly caught her up on the details, including my mother's acting like a pill. Not that Ambrosia was interested in our relationship. That eggnog flood sounds awfully suspicious, Ambrosia said. Do you think she used eggnog to make that man? Like how a golem can get conjured up out of mud? Your hypothesis is as good as anything I've got, I said. I wouldn't mind kissing a man made of eggnog if someone were to conjure one for me. I bet his kisses would be delicious. I shook my head. Wow, I sure hope Bentley gets back in time for Christmas. Someone needs to protect me from myself. Ambrosia wriggled her fingers, which were still trapped inside my hand. If only there were some way we could find out. Leave it be, I said more sternly. Why don't you focus your exuberant teen witch energy on something useful, like finding me a reliable brand of frozen lasagna that tastes better than the cardboard box it comes in? All right, she said in that heavy, burdened way that only teenagers could manage. Ooh, Zoe said excitedly, bouncing on her toes. Look, they're about to light the tree. Ambrosia and I turned to face the very tall evergreen tree that had been trucked in and erected in the middle of the park. The gazebo that usually stood there had been dismantled and transported elsewhere for annual inspection, maintenance, and repainting. Wisteria was dead serious about gazebo maintenance. My aunt's co-workers at City Hall had been busy for three weeks with all the permits and paperwork. Now, after everyone's hard work, it was time for the show. Once lit, the tree would stay bright and gleaming until the new year, at which point there would be another party. The tree was a Norway spruce, and it was 76 feet tall, a foot taller than the one in Rockefeller Center in New York. It towered high above everything in the small town. Was it overkill? Perhaps, but it was also magnificent and made me proud to be a tax-paying resident of Wisteria. The crowd began to count in unison. Ten, nine, eight. The dark tree began to glow in a way it shouldn't have. Seven, six, five. Not only was it glowing, but it was also smoking. Thin tendrils of pink smoke emerged from between the branches, forming fluffy clouds. Four, three. People standing in the front row started to cough and complain about the smoke. Two. Someone screamed, Something's moving inside the tree! It's alive! The chorus had weakened, but they pronounced the final digit clearly. One! The mayor's deputy, who was standing at a podium with a comically large lever, switched the lever to power. The tree lit up with thousands of tiny glittering lights. All the better to illuminate the smoke that was now emanating at every level. Someone yelled, Stop! Stop! Turn it off! Everyone turned to the mayor's deputy, who replied with a frantic, The switch doesn't do anything. It's just for show. The tree is on a timer, and I can't turn it off. Several people in the crowd yelled, Fire! Get back! I sensed that my young companions were about to do something reckless and hurl themselves into the action. I shot my daughter a warning look, but it was too late. I found myself making eye contact with a small red fox. 
Ambrosia was casting reveal spells left and right. Calm down, you two, I said. It's just an electrical fire. The fox yipped and then disappeared into the crowd. Ambrosia said, Something living was inside the tree, but it's gone now. She looked up at the dark sky. Did you feel that? Something just flew over us. Red lights flashed and the fire department pulled up. Within seconds, the power was shut off, the fire was extinguished, and the crowd dispersed to find something less depressing than a burned-up Christmas tree to gather around. I scanned the crowd for my fellow witches. I couldn't find Maisie or her strange date, but I did spot a few supernaturals talking to each other about the strange incident. They looked as confused and mystified as anyone. I, however, was not mystified. First, there had been a food-related incident. Now there had been pink smoke and a winged escape. One really obvious suspect came to mind. Ribbons, I said. That was the name of the tiny telepathic wyvern who hung around our house and kept me company during my late nights experimenting with spells and potions in the basement. Ribbons, agreed my daughter Zoe, who was suddenly standing next to me in human form. Much to my surprise, she'd already completed her sniff investigation and returned. I smelled him in the air. But he doesn't smell, I said. Zoe wrinkled her nose. It's an animal thing. Pheromones? Something like that. This was clearly his work, I said. He's named Ribbons because he blows ribbons of fire and smoke like what was coming out of the tree. He must have been hiding up there, up to no good. I don't know, Ambrosia said. The thing that flew over my head felt more like a bat. Sometimes Ribbons flies with bats for cover, I said. Ambrosia nodded. Then it was probably him, she wrinkled her nose. I know he's a curmudgeon who hates people, but is he also a Grinch who wants to ruin Christmas? It does seem that way, I said. Burning down a tree does seem awfully Grinch-like, even for Ribbons, Zoe said. He must be stopped. What are the three of us going to do about it? Nothing, I said. We can't let him ruin Christmas, Zoe said, pouting. It's our first one here. What I meant is that the three of us don't have to do anything, I said. As the sole adult here, I shall be taking care of all necessary disciplinary actions involving the occupants of the Riddle House. I puffed up my chest. It's time for some traditional old-school parenting, some laying down of the law. Zoe raised her eyebrows. Why start now? Ha ha, I said. Then I ruffled her hair as punishment. You two can stay out as late as you'd like as long as you stick together. I'm going to head home to have a few words with that smart-mouthed, bad-mannered, over-educated lizard. Zoe said, You tell him, Mom. Yeah! Ambrosia said, and tell him to stop swooping at my mother when she's unloading the groceries. It's not fair. She's got no magic to protect herself with. He made off with the Rocky Road ice cream last week. Your Rocky Road ice cream? He's gone too far. I smacked my fist into my open palm. Someone's gonna get spanked tonight, right on his scaly little bottom. Chapter 5 Two hours later, I was working at my rustic wood desk in my dungeon-like basement, sounds cozy, right, when a creature arrived. Ribbons, an adult male wyvern no bigger than an owl, flitted down to my desk and landed with a scrape of his talons, gouging an extra set of scars in the heavily marked surface. My stairs, floors, and every stick of furniture in the house was marked by similar battle scars. The wyvern, as well as my cat, my fox daughter, and now the budgie too, all took great delight in chasing each other around the house, scraping with their nails and claws while screaming, meowing, yipping, and tweeting their fool heads off. Lucky for me, I like the distressed look. Good evening, Zed. Ribbons didn't vocalize except inside my head where I heard him speak in what I called his Count Chocula accent. Hello, I said playing it cool as I pretended to be engrossed in my transcriptions. I was copying a spell from an old book. 
It was the sort of thing that had to be done with a special type of pen and ink, or the spell would erase itself from the source and cease to work. A great many spells have been lost over the years during witches' attempts to automate the process through digital means. One stupid witch nearly burned her house down just by taking a picture of the corner of a spell using her phone. Okay, that witch was me. At least I'd memorized a reliable spell for fire retardant foam and I'd stopped the fire before it had taken much more than some loose paper and my favorite cardigan. Ribbons played with my candles, passing his hand talons through the flames before licking them. He followed up by swiping his long purple tongue over his eyeballs to clean them. The ancient, ageless wyvern had eyelids, so his eyes should have been self-cleaning, yet he seemed to prefer using his tongue. I approve of the ganders, he said. Much better for your focus studies than ghastly electric light, especially those unearthly LEDs. I like to set a mood, I said. He waddled duck-like over to my hot cocoa, dipped the front of his seahorse-shaped head into the liquid, and blew mint-scented ribbons of steam into the liquid to give it a reheat. Seeing him perform a thoughtful gesture almost made me feel bad for assuming he was the one behind the day's strange catastrophes. Almost. Ribbons, I said lightly. Zed, he replied also lightly. Do you have anything you'd like to confess? He clasped his scaly hands together, fanned out his wings in a flutter, and gazed up at me with his big black monster eyes. In a psychic whisper, he guiltily said, I ate your lasagna. Anything else? I swooped on Mrs. Abernathy and took her ice cream. It was Rocky Road. Anything else? I've been using the kitty litter. That explains a lot. I crossed my arms and gave him a stern look, fingers tapping on my bicep. Anything else? He unclasped his talons, stepped back, dropped his wings, and went back to playing with my candle flames. Ribbons? I didn't do it, he said. What didn't you do? I have an alibi, he said. An alibi for what? He took to the air with a furious flapping of his wings. I do not have to explain myself to you, human. You are beneath me. You are less interesting and more empty than a deformed cosmetic salesperson who uses computers. Are you talking about social media influencers? <gasps> Ribbons! You've said some nasty things, but that takes the cake. He hovered above the desk, threatening to extinguish my candles with his wings. I have an alibi, he said again. Behind me, the door at the top of the stairs creaked open. My mother came down, looking gorgeous in a black silk nightgown, her bare arms shining like the moon. She made a tisk-tisk sound, and Ribbons launched himself into her arms. She held him as he curled up like a defenseless kitten in the crook of her elbow. There, there, she said soothingly to the fierce creature. Mother, I didn't hear you come home. I said. Creatures of the grave are sneaky and quiet, she said icily. Don't you know? She stroked Ribbon's head like she was a supervillain in a spy movie and he was her beloved pet. My mother really liked Ribbon's. She could have him. I'd gladly throw him in her suitcase myself. Is that why you ran off in a huff? Because I implied you were a monster? What's the matter? You can snack on genies and choke old ladies, but you can't take a few colorful descriptors? They're just words. She shot me a withering gaze. You, of all people, should understand the power of words. I felt the tightness in my throat again. There, there. She cooed at ribbons before fixing me again with her icy gaze. What manner of torture were you subjecting this poor creature to? I was trying to get to sleep, and all I could hear was his psychic screams of distress. Ribbons gave me a smug, self-satisfied look. I wasn't torturing him, I said. I was giving him the opportunity to explain to me why he burned down the town's Christmas tree today at the lighting ceremony. 
She looked down at the wyvern in her arms, then back up at me. He did no such thing, she said. I did hear about that incident. Ribbons and I were together at the time, two streets over from the park, enjoying a nice lobster bisque. It was a regular restaurant, so the poor thing had to hide himself in my purse like one of those yappy dogs. Even so, he was still a better dinner companion than most. Are you serious? He really does have an alibi? Are you 100% sure that when the Christmas tree went up in some very wyvern-like flames, the two of you were having lobster bisque? He didn't sneak out of your purse for a potty break in someone's cat litter box? He was with me, she said. Having lobster bisque? She stared at me evenly. We may have been on the cheese course by then. She looked down at Ribbons and said, I know it shouldn't matter which course it was, but you know how my daughter is when she gets an idea in her head. There's nothing she loves more than accusing others of wrongdoings. It really deflects the attention from the questionable things she does. What about the eggnog? I asked. The big flood at Dreamland? He's got no alibi for that because he wasn't with us then. She nodded as he spoke directly into her mind, then answered, he says you should know him better than to think he would waste perfectly good eggnog by pouring it in the streets. No alibi, though. Another pause. He was helping your Gorgon friend. You should check with her. I believe he means the one who wears those strange silver jumpsuits to distract from the snakes in her hair. I put my hands on my hips. Why isn't he talking to me directly? Why is he going through you? My mother stared at me like the answer was the most obvious thing in the world. Why, he's frightened of you, dear. You're an adult witch with powers unlike any other in this world and a temperament to match. You can be rather terrifying. And with that, she turned and left, still cradling the wyvern in her arms. Chapter 6 December 24th, One Day to Christmas I woke up with a fluffy white cat on my chest. Boa, our resident princess. She stared me in the eyes and gently pressed one paw on my lips. Before I could say anything else, she spoke. Ham? I pushed her paw away from my mouth. Good morning to you, Boa. Did you sleep well? Ham? It doesn't sound like you've been working on your vocabulary at all. Still just the one word, huh? Ham. Shall we get up and start the day? How about some scrambled eggs and, hmm, something that goes well with eggs. Any suggestions? I have pesto, so I could make green eggs and... I waited, eyebrows raised in anticipation. Boa opened her pink mouth and said, Meow. Great talking with you. I squeezed out from under her and started getting ready for the day. The cat swished around my feet, threatening to trip me, so I levitated her two inches off the ground for safekeeping. Boa looked down in confusion as she moved all four legs in a swimming pattern, trying in vain to touch the floor. Although the cat had gained the ability to speak by eating a clockward messenger bird back in October, she had not received any boost to her brain power. She was still just a cat, with cat comprehension. She could see ghosts, but everyone knows most cats can do that. I let my closet select my outfit for the day, a spectacularly ugly Christmas sweater with jingling bells, and got ready. I got a head start on the stairs, my ugly sweater bells jingling all the way, before releasing the cat from her floating hold. She still beat me to the kitchen. Inside the kitchen, which was still dark as the sun hadn't risen yet, I found our resident ghost. Mrs. Pinkman was puttering around by the sink, lost in her own world. Good morning, Mrs. P., I said. It's Christmas Day tomorrow. This year has flown by. She gave me a polite smile and used a ghostly cloth to polish silverware that wasn't really there. It's our first one since Zoe and I moved here. I made myself a coffee and promptly yawned into it. Remember how we used to have those Christmas morning parties in the lobby? Mrs. Pinkman had been our neighbor before Zoe and I moved to Wisteria. 
The elderly woman had died recently and had found her way across the country to us, where she seemed to be sticking around as a companion for her beloved budgie, Marzipants. She nodded and smiled. Ghosts didn't speak, and they were too confused to be helpful most of the time, but Mrs. Pinkman was more grounded in our reality than most. I'd grown to enjoy chatting with her over coffee in the winter mornings. She would disappear with the sunrise most days, so this was the extent of our relationship. Unlike most of the ghosts I'd dealt with, she'd died naturally, so she wasn't a case I needed to solve. Of course, it was never a planned party, I said, because it was true. We'd all arrive in the lobby one by one under the auspices of checking for any last-minute deliveries. Then everyone would linger around the couches by the front doors. Someone would inevitably run up to their apartment and return with cookies or a carafe of coffee, and we'd be there all day. Most of the residents of the building were single, older people. They were the type who usually got invited to larger families' Christmas Day dinners, but didn't have much planned for the early part of the day. They were also the type who wouldn't show up in the lobby for anything as undignified as a planned party with their neighbors. They were too cool for that. We were like family, I said to Mrs. Pinkman. No matter what we've been fighting about all year, remember the kerfuffle over the wording on the welcome mat? I shook my head and looked down at my coffee. Come Christmas Day, you'd never know we'd been fighting right up to the day before over the stupidest, pettiest things. When I looked up again, Mrs. Pinkman was gone. I turned to the cat who was giving herself a post-breakfast bath. Looks like it's just you and me, Boa. What have you got to say for yourself? Ready for your second course of... The cat's eyes flashed open as though she had just remembered some important business in the other room. She walked off at top speed, her fluffy white tail swishing like an animated question mark. I downed my coffee and chased it with another. I was tired. My sleep had been fitful, full of looping dreams in which I was arguing with my mother while digging myself deeper, literally digging myself deeper with a shovel in a field of dead grass. The night before, I hadn't taken her comments about me being terrifying too seriously, but it still bothered me that she would say such a thing. I tried so hard to be a good witch. Other than a few chores around the house, I generally reserved my magic for helping others, such as the ghosts who came to me for saving or avenging. I worked hard at my job at the library, and I tried to mother without smothering. When it came to my karmic scorecard, I had to be doing well. After all, several nice people were still alive and walking around thanks to me. How dare that little wyvern suck up to my mother and make out that I was the bad one? Me! Zara Riddle, the librarian who could never get through her to-be-read stack of paperbacks because she was always running around on some sort of important mission. This bad, vaguely guilty feeling I had was all Ribbon's fault. As soon as I figured out how he'd managed to burn down a Christmas tree while sipping lobster bisque inside my mother's purse, I was going to get a full apology. Right before I tossed him into my mother's suitcase and kicked both of them out the front door. Or a window whatever was most handy. I got up and poured a third cup of coffee. As I stood by the sink, looking out at the sidewalk, the house was on the corner which gave me a good view of the neighborhood from several rooms, I noticed a group of neighbors gathering under a street lamp. They were talking about something, waving their hands and looking around in the dim light. A few more people walking by stopped and joined the throng. Was this a local custom? similar to my former neighbors and their lobby party except the day before Christmas? I cast a quick invisible lid spell to keep my coffee from spilling from the mug, pulled on a pair of pointy-toed boots, and went outside to join the party, once again jingling all the way in my Christmas sweater. The sun was rising, turning the frost into diamonds and lighting the steam coming from my mouth. My coffee, thanks to the lid spell, wasn't steaming. Only the most observant person, such as another witch, would notice such a thing. But just to be safe, I poked a steam vent in the center of the lid spell. It was the responsible thing to do. I wasn't just keeping my power secret, but the powers of all the local supernaturals. As I approached the street lamp and the group of neighbors, one of them called out a friendly greeting. 
Hello, Zara. It was Arden Grayson, a man in his seventies who lived across the street. He was chatty and friendly, and we had spoken in the past about his hobby, hunting sea monsters. The furry, white-eyebrowed man didn't seem to have any powers of his own, but I knew his great-niece was a tattoo mage, so it was likely he had some gifts, whether he knew it or not. Hello, Arden, I said. How are things? I lost a tenant, he said, referring to the converted garage he rented out. She took off and left her roommate with the next rent bill. He's a nice kid, so I'm going to cut him a deal to keep him around. That's very thoughtful of you. I kept my expression neutral and didn't let on that I knew all about his former tenant. She was currently being chased across the country by my vampire detective boyfriend to be brought to justice. Yup, he said, and he proceeded to introduce me to our fellow neighbors. Some of them I'd seen around, and a few I knew by name from the library. Most of them seemed to already know who I was. They'd say, so nice to finally meet you in that knowing way. I gave the group a wary look and said, am I famous in this neighborhood because I bought the red house on the corner? The one that everyone has a nickname for? I snapped my fingers and played dumb. The red fire hall or something like that? A rosy-cheeked, middle-aged woman said, We call it the Red Witch House, but we don't mean anything by it. None of us believe in such hocus-pocus. Although... She looked around at the others. There have been some strange going-ons lately, one of the men said. A woman said, Things that go bump in the night. Another man said, Things that come down the chimney and track soot all over my freshly steam-cleaned white carpets. The others murmured in agreement. A chorus of people all started talking at once about nightly visits from a wild animal of some sort, one that raided their refrigerators and cupboards and left telltale sooty marks all over the place. I asked, It's a creature who comes down your chimney like Santa Claus? A man said, Santa would never be so rude. It's not him. The others agreed. I don't even have a chimney, the rosy-cheeked woman said, but I do have a cat flap for patches, and the darn thing must be using that. I think it's a raccoon. Raccoons don't come down chimneys, a man said. I suppose they could come down, but how would they get out again? Arden said, Raccoons have little hands that are very sensitive and adept. Have you seen a raccoon fishing? They reach into the water and scoop out the fish lickety-split. Oh, dear, sputtered one of the men. I didn't see my favorite fish this morning in the aquarium. I thought he was hiding behind the filter. But you don't suppose this nocturnal raider got to it, do you? The group went quiet and looked down. I asked the group, Do you all live nearby? They all lived within a few blocks. I asked, have you heard if this is happening in other parts of town? They didn't know. Arden said to me, Don't you know some of the local police? What about the dark-haired girl who's always jogging? You could ask her. He met my half-sister Persephone. She was a detective with the local police. I'll check in with her, I said. Have any of you reported these incidents to the police? They all murmured that they had not and that they wouldn't want to bother anyone with a minor nuisance. The aquarium owner puffed up his chest. I will definitely be filing a report if it turns out Mr. Finley has been the victim of this late-night chimney bandit, he explained. Mr. Finley is my prize angelfish. Not Mr. Finley, gasped the rosy-cheeked woman. He's the best one. Arden said to me, Zara, have you had any strange incidents at your house? Strange, yes, but not unusual, I said, laughing at the joke that exactly zero people in the crowd got. I quickly added, by which I mean, no, nothing like what you're describing, but I'll certainly keep my eyes open. With that, the group appeared to have been satisfied. One by one, people pulled away and returned to their own homes or continued their early morning walks. I thanked Arden for the introductions and went on my way as well.
Was it possible that whoever or whatever was behind the local chimney raids was the same party responsible for burning the Christmas tree and spilling the eggnog? I didn't return to my house right away. I sipped my hot coffee and jingled my sweater bells as I went for a long walk around the neighborhood, keeping my eyes open as I cast a few spells. The spells didn't reveal anything that seemed related to a mischievous raccoon or any other creature. But that didn't mean one wasn't hiding nearby. Chapter 7 When I returned to the witch house from my walk, the place was buzzing with activity. Every light in the place was on, and Marzy Pants was flitting around and chirping happily in his new cage. He was quite an old bird, and had been one foot in the grave when he had come to us, but the budgie had made a spectacular comeback under my roof. He was still cranky and terrorized Zoe whenever he could, but he was growing on her. Ambrosia Abernathy had stayed over the night before, so I found her and Zoe in the kitchen with my mother. Zirconia Riddle, who had been a witch before renouncing her powers years ago, was drilling Ambrosia on the egg spell, the one that involved peeling a freshly laid, unboiled egg without breaking its form. Ambrosia, who should have been alerted to my presence by my jingling sweater bells if she had been keeping her peripheral channels open, jerked her hands in surprise when I walked in the room. The floating egg exploded. A mist of yolk and albumin hung in the air before forming droplets and falling to the floor. All three of them looked at me, the interloper, as though I'd intentionally ruined Ambrosia's spell. I held my free hand up and said, no need to say a word. I can tell when I'm not wanted, even if it is inside my own kitchen, which I paid for. My mother avoided eye contact as she commented to the teens. Someone stepped off the wrong side of the broomstick this morning. Ambrosia gave me the uncomfortable look of someone who knew she was trapped between two armies in a battle that could not be won. Zoe changed the subject with a cheerful, we're out of waffles, Mom, but we have plenty of English muffins. They're great with the snowberry jam. Ambrosia added kudzu berry extract to the latest batch. Tempting, I said. My mother gestured to the empty bar stool next to her at the kitchen island. Don't let me scare you away from one of your overly large meals, Zarabella. You can spill as much as you'd like, and it will only improve the appearance of that sweater. Actually, I just stopped in to drop off my mug. I floated the mug over to the dishwasher. I've got an errand to run. Zoe said, Last minute Christmas shopping? Something like that. I had a mission in mind, but didn't want to discuss it in detail, lest anyone offer to assist me. I'll be swinging by Dreamland Coffee if anyone wants to put in a special order. Without looking up, my mother said, I'd reimburse you for some seed of purpureus, she said. The coffee bean variety. Dark roast, if your friend has it. Ambrosia said, That stuff will wake the dead. Which is perfect for me, my mother said with a merry laugh, because being called dead or undead by anyone other than me was hilarious and delightful. Will do, I said through gritted teeth. Anything for you girls? They asked for eggnog lattes, which I promised to return with. I left the house again, breathed in the chilly morning air, and went to my car. I could have walked to Dreamland, but I hadn't driven in my car for a couple of days, and the poor thing got moody if it felt unneeded. I could relate. When I got to Dreamland Coffee, the downtown location that I usually went to, not the second one at the edge of town, I found the place bustling with happy customers. It was busy, but under control. There were no eggnog puddles, let alone tidal waves. I ducked my head as I entered, slipped past the front counter aided by a stealth spell, and went straight into the back room. The back was where Maisie kept extra beans, as well as where the coven held their meetings. The area was empty, so I quickly dug into my purse for a few basic ingredients that I kept with me at all times. I had only started casting the first spell when I heard someone, or something, clear its throat behind me. I whipped around, used a glamour-busting spell, and saw what I hadn't seen when I'd entered. A Komodo dragon inside a cage. 
Humphrey, I said. Humphrey said nothing. He was, as far as I knew, a regular non-magical Komodo dragon. However, there was something unusual about him that day. He was dressed in a red velvet suit with a green bow tie. I stepped up to the cage for a closer look. I knew that guy was familiar, I said. I knew it. The red and green outfit was the same as the one I'd seen on Maisie's mysterious date at the previous night's tree lighting ceremony. A voice from behind me said, the voice of Maisie Nix said, You found me out. I whirled to find the dark-haired, tall witch watching me with amusement. You made it awfully easy, I said. Having him dressed in the same outfit, it's almost like you wanted to get caught. Maybe I did. I knelt down to look him in the eyes. Why do you keep him in a cage? I like to know where he is, she said. What is he? Humphrey is not a true shifter, if that's what you mean. He started life as a regular Komodo dragon, and that's all he is. Well, he's smarter than average, thanks to some magical enhancements, but he is still just a simple creature. The simple creature you're dating? Not dating. Sure, I do occasionally use magic to turn him into a more appropriate companion for social outings, but only because he frightens people and eats small children. He eats small children? I meant that he could, in theory. But when he's in human form, he behaves himself. He can even go off the leash. I had to ask the obvious question. Maisie, you don't, um, you know. She curled her upper lip. Zara, don't be gross. He's a lizard. I threw my hands up. Sorry, had to ask. Humphrey can barely string together basic English phrases. He wouldn't be up to the task of keeping up with me in the bedroom. I have particular needs that I waved my hands to stop her. No need to explain further. She came over to the cage, opened the gate, and let Humphrey waddle out. The Komodo dragon in the red velvet suit moved slowly, flicking his tongue over my boots in greeting. Good boy, Maisie said. You're a good boy, Humphrey. He looked up at her with what might have been a smile. He doesn't look very speedy, I commented. How is he with chimneys? Can he crawl up and down vertical surfaces like a gecko? Why, do you need someone to sweep your chimney? Maisie waggled her eyebrows. I thought Bentley would be giving you all the chimney sweeping you need. Maisie was a tad sex obsessed, particularly when it came to my private life. I sighed before explaining my suspicions. I'm just wondering if Humphrey might have something to do with recent events around town and in my neighborhood. Someone's been coming down people's chimneys, tracking soot all over and stealing food. Humphrey is well fed, Maisie said. That sounds like something your wyvern would do. He's not my wyvern, but I see your point. I thought the same thing. I was hoping it might be Humphrey just so I wouldn't have to deal with the problem myself. But now I'm back to square one. Three mysterious events and no new suspects. Maisie grew excited, fingers twitching as magic crackled in her palms. Oh, a Christmas mystery. Do you need some help? Should we call an emergency book club meeting with the girls? Thanks, but I have it under control for now. I started to head back to the front to order lattes, but paused. Actually, there are two things you can help me with. First, can I get some seed of purpurius for my mother? Absolutely. The tall witch opened a bag of shiny beans and scooped some into a takeout bag. What else? I see that you still have Humphrey dressed in the red velvet outfit. Are you planning to turn him into a human-shaped escort again soon? Uh. She looked away guiltily, then called the lizard over and started removing the outfit. I thought he could take me for a walk tomorrow, but there's no need to keep him dressed up all day. She wasn't going to volunteer the information, so I asked her directly. Do you have plans for Christmas Day, Maisie? My niece is out of town visiting her family, Maisie said, implying that she didn't have plans. In that case, I'd love it if you would pop in at my house. I said. Oh, I wouldn't want to impose. You've got Zinnia and your mother, and, well, I'm sure you'll have a houseful, since you always do. You need to pop in. 
because I need your help with a spell, I said, making up a white lie on the spot. Please come by at ten o'clock. It's time-sensitive. I had no idea what my time-sensitive job was, but I was a resourceful witch. Time-sensitive. I suppose I could fit it into my schedule. She folded the lizard's tiny outfit and set it atop his cage. Ten o'clock? Yes, don't be late. She snorted. I took the magic beans, thanked her for them, and went out front to order some eggnog lattes. Zara tries to be a good witch, especially at Christmas. Chapter 8 By the time I got home with the girls' eggnog lattes and my mother's wake-the-dead coffee beans, I had formulated a new plan to find out who or what was raiding people's homes in the neighborhood. I waited to share my plan. Zoe and Ambrosia were having dinner at the Abernathy's that night pot roast and mashed potatoes with mushroom gravy, so it was just me and my mother. To avoid getting into another fight over my cooking, by which I mean microwaving, I took her to VJ's for the Indian food buffet. She ate two plates full of food, which she pronounced spicy but good. We went for a walk after dinner, strolling over to the park where a crew of workers was preparing the replacement tree for a second attempt at a tree lighting ceremony. The crowd that gathered was even bigger than the previous nights, and I overheard several people saying it was even more exciting to see the tree lit on Christmas Eve. My mother and I watched as the mayor herself, the tree redo was too important a job to be left to a deputy, threw the switch to light the tree. This time there was no smoke, no fire, no flashing lights or firefighters. Everyone murmured in wonder at the countless tiny twinkling lights that stretched up to the heavens. Now this is how Christmas Eve ought to be done, my mother said in a rare approving tone. I'm glad you like it, I said, and I'm glad our local mischief maker isn't around to ruin it. I told you, Ribbons was with me last night. He didn't burn down anything. Mom, I'd love nothing more than to find out Ribbons is innocent, but you have to admit that the neighborhood chimney raids are awfully suspicious. I did some more digging. Of course you did. I felt the tightness in my throat. This time, however, I realized it wasn't coming from my mother or her powers. She wasn't trying to silence me. Well, she was, but not via a vampire chokehold. The tightness in my throat was coming from me. Deep down in some part of my soul, what was left of it anyway, I knew that returning my mother's snark with snark of my own would only result in us both stubbornly drowning in a sea of snark. If things were going to change between us, one of us had to be the adult and make the first gesture. I continued with what I'd been saying in a calm and patient manner as though she hadn't interrupted. I did some digging, and the chimney raids aren't happening everywhere in town. They're localized to a radius around our house. She made a thoughtful expression. It could be something the house itself is doing. I thought of that, and you may be right. Perhaps the house is drawing a creature toward it. Rumor has it the house acts as a longevity pool for some. Like a fountain of youth? She looked very intrigued. What older woman wouldn't be? Not a literal fountain, but perhaps a different form. Have you ever looked inside the medicine cabinet in the upstairs bathroom? That cabinet goes back far and deeper than it should, and new products keep appearing all the time. I have a hypothesis that the new creams and scrubs may have anti-aging properties, real ones. Interesting. I'll have to try some of those creams. I need all the help I can get. Contrary to popular belief, vampires do age. Please help yourself and take as many samples with you as you'd like. Her head snapped back. I hadn't meant anything nasty by what I said, but she stared at me as though I had. Don't worry, she said curtly. I'll be leaving as soon as Christmas is over. My throat tightened again. I remained calm. She was only acting out because she felt attacked. Despite her powers, she still thought of herself as a defenseless creature. 
That's not what I meant, I said gently. You can stay as long as you like. She gave me a look that said she didn't believe me. I said, how do you feel about going on a stakeout tonight? One dark, elegant eyebrow hitched up. A stakeout? Oh, Zarabella, don't tell me you still believe in Santa Claus. Honestly, given what I've seen this year, I don't know what I do and don't believe anymore. The crowd in the park was dispersing, so we made our way closer to the tree so we could get our picture taken in front of the lights. But I don't believe a jolly man from the North Pole has been raiding my neighborhood. I should hope not. I'd like to do a stakeout next door at the Moore House, sort of a sting operation. Why not at your own house? I have so many protection spells on that place. Some of them are complicated ones that Zinnia had her friend Vincent Wick help put in place. It would take ages to undo them all, and then we'd all be exposed. Perhaps I'm overthinking this, but if someone wanted to gain access to the house, this current situation could be an elaborate trap set by them to get me to take down my own defenses. You've given this a lot of thought. Go ahead and tell me I'm paranoid. I wouldn't say that, she said. This house you want to do the sting with, do you mean the blue one right next door? Yes, it hasn't been sold to new owners yet, so it's sitting there empty. My friend Charlize was staying there for a while, but it's vacant right now. The chimney bandit probably hasn't visited yet because there's nothing to raid inside. But if someone were to bring over a bunch of tasty food, the bandit might make an appearance tonight. Which is when you and I will catch whomever or whatever it is. You and I? I can't do it by myself. I batted my eyelashes and tried to look helpless. What if the bandit is dangerous? She rolled her eyes. You and I both know perfectly well that you can handle anything this world throws at you. True, but I'd like you to come with me. You would? I would. She looked away quickly. I suppose it would give us something to do this evening, and it would be nice to get away from that screeching budgie. You said the house is empty, though. Where shall we sleep? We'll bring sleeping bags, I said. It will be fun, like that time we went camping. We never went camping. We did, I said. I was six years old. We made a fire, roasted marshmallows, and slept under the stars. We did, she said, frowning. I remember now. You remember that? It was one of the most magical nights of my life, I said. She blinked repeatedly and stared off into space dreamily. I wanted to take you somewhere nice that summer, but money was tight. I didn't even own a tent. I had to borrow one. The stupid thing was full of dried mud and some sort of insect that fed on us all night. We barely slept a wink. It was perfect, I said, looping my arm around her thin waist and hugging her to my side as I leaned in. I only hope tonight is half as much fun. Oh, Zarabella. She kissed me on top of my head, then cleared her throat and tried to push me away. Stand up straight. The photographer is coming. Posture, posture. We don't want to look sloppy. I responded by hugging her even tighter as the photographer took our picture. Chapter 9 Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the moor's empty house, not a creature was stirring, except for my vampire mother, who was snoring. I knew we shouldn't have opened that second bottle of wine, I muttered to myself as I rolled her onto her side in her sleeping bag. She stirred again, but didn't wake up. She went back to regular, non-snoring breaths. I sat up in my own sleeping bag and looked at the fireplace for the hundredth time that night. If anything were to come through, I would be warned by the alarm I'd put in place. It wasn't a magical alarm. My gut told me that anything clever enough to travel up and down chimneys might also be scared away by protective magic. I'd simply taken the tiny bells off my ugly Christmas sweater and strung them in a crisscross pattern in front of the empty fireplace. 
It was four o'clock in the morning, and there had been no sign of anything yet. I opened a bag of potato chips and dumped it into a bowl next to the smorgasbord of treats that were already sitting out throughout the living room. I munched on chips until sleeping seemed more appealing than eating junk food, at which point I settled back down in my sleeping bag. My stakeout was a great idea, but I had to be patient. It could take more than one night to catch the troublemaker. I was just drifting off when I heard it. The tinkle of tiny bells. I held my breath and waited, eyes closed. I could hear my mother breathing softly next to me. I allowed myself to resume breathing, falling into the same rhythm as her, all the better to pretend I was sleeping. The bells tinkled again. There was a scruffling sound, and then a frenzy of bell ringing, as though something had gotten strung up in the lines and was struggling to free itself. The bells went quiet. The house was silent, except for the riddle women breathing. Then there were footfalls. They had a tick-tick sound. The invader had cloths, and either two feet or four feet, hard to tell. It did sound very light, closer to the weight of a mouse than a cat. If Humphrey hadn't already been crossed off my suspect list, he would have been now. There was no way the raider was a Komodo dragon. Humphrey had to weigh 150 pounds in his natural form. I kept very still as I cast a spell to cover the front of the fireplace. It was the same spell I'd used as a coffee lid recently, a bread-and-butter type of barrier spell that could be used in endless ways. That would keep the creature from escaping once it realized it had been caught. There were more sounds, crunching and munching. My potato chips were being noisily consumed. I gradually opened my eyes and lifted my head to see what was eating my chips. It was a creature, barely bigger than a mouse. It was scaly, with two leathery wings attached to its front legs. It was a miniature version of ribbons. Psst, I said to get its attention. The creature, who hadn't been expecting someone to psst at it, flapped its wings and sent the chip bowl crashing into a nearby wall. It flew for the fireplace exit, only to be bounced back by the invisible barrier. My mother, who must have been alerted by the crashing chip bowl, sat up suddenly. The tiny wyvern immediately flew at her, only to lodge itself in her long hair. My mother shrieked, It's a bat! Get it off of me! It probably has rabies! I grabbed her hands to keep her from hurting the tiny guy. I knew wyverns were practically indestructible, but it did appear to be a baby, which made me feel instantly protective of it. Just then, something came smashing through a side window and flying into the room. It was Ribbons. He must have heard the small one's psychic distress calls. Ribbons managed to give me the stink eye the entire time he rescued and untangled the small version of himself from my mother's hair. The youngster climbed onto Ribbons' back, gave me a junior-sized version of the wyvern stink eye, and clung there as Ribbons hovered mid-air above me and my mother. Ribbons didn't put any words in my head. By the look on my mother's face, he wasn't talking to her either. The small one was the same mix of iridescent purple and green as ribbons. That meant it was a male since the females were red. I'd never seen a red wyvern, and it was assumed the females were extinct, at least in our own dimension. My mother quietly combed through her hair with her hands. After a long, awkward silence, I said, Congratulations, ribbons. I see you have a son. I looked at the small one specifically. What's your name, little guy? The little wyvern tilted his head back and squawked. Ribbons answered. He doesn't speak yet, Zed. I felt our psychic link widen as he expanded his broadcast to include my mother in his communications. And he has no name. His mother abandoned him before the naming ceremony. My heart squeezed. I heard my mother make a sympathetic sound. I didn't dare comment on Ribbon's statement about the mother of the child being out of the picture. If there was anything he hated more than being scolded, it was being pitied. 
Sure, he would suck up to my mother for sympathy, but that was on his terms, and everyone knew it was just an act. To be truly pitied would mean that the wyvern was not completely in control of his life, something he'd never admit. I had to say something nice. What did people say to the parents of newborns or new hatchlings? Compliments, mainly. He's absolutely terrifying, I said. You must be so proud. Ribbon stopped flapping and let himself settle at the base of my sleeping bag. My mother chimed in with, He's the stuff of nightmares. The adult wyvern's chest puffed up with pride. He will be a menace to all of humanity someday. He's off to a good start, I said. I'm assuming tonight's raid of my potato chips was not an isolated event. About that. Ribbon said, a guilty tone to his Count Chocula accent. I am new to the rearing of offspring. My son is a curious thing and has found his way into more trouble than anticipated. But I have consulted my elders, and I can assure you the incidents will cease. Is your son the one who caused the eggnog flood at Dreamland? Ribbons nodded. Did he also burn down the town's Christmas tree? Only the first one, Ribbon said. He did not singe a single needle on the second one. Not yet, I said. He will not, Ribbon said. I will be more... I will try... The little one must have been bored with the conversation because he started gnawing on his father's ears. My mother said, Parenting is hard. Indeed, Ribbons replied. But anything that's worth doing is always hard, she said. Just remember that everything you do will be worth it one day when you see what your progeny has become. He leapt into the air again. I am not to be pitied, vile demon. And then he flew off, back out the broken window, with the little one clinging to his shoulder ridge and flapping his wings as well. I waved a hand to cast another lid seal spell on the broken window to keep out the draft until I could get it fixed, then turned to my mother. Our Christmas mystery has been solved, I said. Shall we pack up and head back to the house? She snuggled down in her sleeping bag. But I'm all comfy and warm. Can't we stay until morning? It's so nice and quiet here, away from the cat and the bird and everyone else. Sure, I said, using magic to straighten out our sleeping bags and tuck both of us in. See you in the morning. In the morning, she said sleepily. I whispered, Merry Christmas. Chapter 10, December 25th, Christmas Day. My first and best gift of the day was Bentley returning from his out-of-town business. I ran out to the porch and threw myself at him before he could take more than one step up the stairs. Told you I'd be back in time for Christmas, he said before I smothered him in kisses. When I finally let him breathe, he said, How are things with my maker? He was referring to my mother since it was her blood that he'd used to become a vampire. I gagged dramatically as I pulled away. She's my maker too, but we shouldn't call her that. It makes it seem like we're siblings. I looked him up and down. He seemed to be in the same good condition as he'd been when he'd left, at least from what I could see. How did it go? Did you get your suspect? He looked down. She could not be saved, he said glumly. I'd been hoping for better news, but fully expecting the worst. The woman he'd been chasing down had tried to kill two people that I knew of, with one of them being me. I couldn't say I felt terribly sad she wouldn't be around to finish what she'd started. He looked up at me, then passed me at the house, his silver-gray eyes more beautiful than ever. They're all waiting inside there, aren't they? Can you feel it? Yes. He narrowed his eyes briefly. Your mother, your half-sister, your daughter, your aunt, and two other witches. Ambrosia, of course, and Maisie Nix? 
He raised his eyebrows. I asked her to come by and help me with a spell to stuff the turkey. Did you know that you can stuff a turkey without magic? There's a big hole in one end. You just stick your hand right in there. You asked Maisie Nix to help you stuff a turkey, he said, more as a statement than a question. It's Christmas, I said. I couldn't leave her to her own devices. The poor thing gets so lonely. Did you know she dresses her Komodo dragon in humiliating outfits and makes him escort her around town and heaven knows what else? She uses magic to turn him into human form. She actually brought him along today. He's been staring at the budgie for hours, licking his lips. Marzy Pants has been playing dead, but he's not very good at it, and he keeps peeking. Bentley sniffed the air. That explains why I can smell lizard. I was worried that you'd decided to cook a meat dish other than turkey. I did pick up a honey-glazed ham. I poked him in the chest. For you? He grabbed my finger, squeezed it, and gave me a knowing look. For me? Fine, I said. It's for Boa, but you can have some if you get to it before Ribbons and Junior. Junior? Ribbons has a son, a new hatchling. The mother took off, back to her own dimension. I guess this is all news to you, huh? It is. He gave me a weary look. That'll teach me for leaving town. He scratched the back of his head. I only got back about an hour ago. I drove all night. You probably want to go home and shower and get some sleep. I bet the last thing you want to do is hang out in a house packed full of witches and pets. He was still holding my hand, and he brought my fingers to his lips and kissed them. I am tired, but there's nowhere else I'd rather be, he said. Merry Christmas. I glanced up, pointedly. Ahem. He looked up and finally noticed the mistletoe I'd hung overhead specifically for this moment. I've walked into a trap, he said. The best kind of trap, too. The kind you don't notice until it's too late. He almost smiled. I guess I have no choice but to kiss you, he said. And he did. I snuggled into his arms and enjoyed the moment. There was no need to tell him that one or more of the pets had eaten his Christmas present and his favorite sweater. That news could wait. All that mattered was that it was finally Christmas and we were all together as one big happy family. This has been Critter Calamity, a Wisteria Witches Mysteries Christmas short story, book 12.5. Written by Angela Pepper. Narrated by Tiffany Williams. Audio engineer, Sean Williams. Produced by Airbending Media Productions, LLC. Copyright 2021 by Angela Pepper. Production copyright by Angela Pepper.